Chapter Seventeen of At the Time Appointed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. At the Time Appointed by A. Maynard Barbour. Chapter Seventeen. She knows her father's will is law. Though the succeeding days and weeks dragged wearily for Darrell, he applied himself anew to work and study, and only the lurking shadows within his eyes, the deepening lines on his face, the fast multiplying gleams of silver in his dark hair, gave evidence of his suffering. And if to Kate the summer seemed suddenly to have lost its glory and music, if she found the round of social pleasures on which she had just entered grown strangely insipid, if it sometimes seemed to her that she had quaffed all the richness and sweetness of life on that wondrous first night, till only the dregs remained, she gave no sign. With her sunny smile and lightsome ways, she reigned supreme, both in society and in the home and none but her aunt and Darrell missed the old-time rippling laughter, or noted the deepening wistfulness and seriousness of the fair young face. Her father watched her with growing pride, and with a visible satisfaction which told of carefully laid plans known only to himself, whose consummation he deemed not far distant. Acting on the suggestion of his sister, he had been closely observant of both Kate and Darrell, but any conclusions which he formed he kept to himself and went his way apparently well satisfied. At the close of an unusually busy day, late in the summer, Darrell was seated alone in his office, reviewing his life in the West, and vaguely wondering what would yet be the outcome of it all when Mr. Underwood entered from the adjoining room. Exultation and elation was patent in his very step, but Darrell, lost in thought, was hardly conscious even of his presence. "'Well, my boy, what are you moaning over?' Mr. Underwood asked good-naturedly, noting Darrell's abstraction. "'Only trying to find a solution for problems as yet insoluble.' Darrell answered with a smile that ended in a sigh. "'Stick to the practical side of life, boy, and let the problems solve themselves. "'A very good rule to follow, provided the problems would solve themselves,' commented Darrell. "'Those things generally work themselves out after a while,' said Mr. Underwood, walking up and down the room. I say, don't meddle with what you can't understand. Take what you can understand, and make a practical application of it. That's always been my motto. And if people would stick to that principle in commercial life, in religion, and everything else, there'd be fewer failures in business, less wrangling in the churches, and more good accomplished generally. I guess you were about right there, Darrell admitted. "'Been pretty busy today, haven't you?' Mr. Underwood asked abruptly after a short pause. "'Yes, uncommonly so. Work is increasing of late.' "'That's good. Well, it has been a busy day with us, rather an eventful one, in fact, one which Walcott and I will remember with pleasure, I trust, for a good many years to come.' "'How is that?' Darrell inquired wondering at the pleasurable excitement in the elder man's tones. "'We made a little change in the partnership today. Walcott is now an equal partner with myself.' Darrell remained silent from sheer astonishment. Mr. Underwood evidently considered his silence an indication of disapproval, for he continued. "'I know you don't like the man, Darrell, so there's no use of arguing that side of the question. But I tell you, he has proved himself invaluable to me. You might not think it, but it's a fact that the business in this office has increased fifty per cent since he came into it. He is thoroughly capable, responsible, honest, 
just the sort of man that i can entrust the business to as i grow older and know that it will be carried out as well as though i was at the helm myself still a half interest seems pretty large for a man with no more capital in the business than he has said darrell determined to make no personal reference to walcott he has put in fifty thousand additional since he came in mr underwood replied darrell whistled softly oh he has money all right i am satisfied of that i am satisfied that he could have furnished the money to begin with only he was lying low well he certainly has nothing to complain of you've done more than well by him no better proportionately than i would have done by you my boy if you had come in with me last spring when i asked you to i had this thing in view then and had made up my mind you'd make the right man for the place but you wouldn't hear of it that's all right mr underwood said darrell i appreciate your kind intentions just the same but i'm more than ever satisfied that i wouldn't have been the right man for the place both men were silent for some little time but neither showed any inclination to terminate the interview mr underwood was still pacing back and forth while darrell had risen and was standing by the window looking out absently into the street that isn't all of it and i may as well tell you the rest said mr underwood suddenly pausing near darrell his manner much like a schoolboy who has a confession to make and hardly knows how to begin mr walcott today asked me asked my permission to pay his addresses to my daughter my little girl he added under his breath and there was a strange note of tenderness in the usually brusque voice if ever darrell was thankful it was that he could at that moment look the father squarely in the face he turned facing mr underwood his dark eyes fairly blazing and you gave your permission he asked slowly with terrible emphasis on each word most assuredly mr underwood retorted quickly stung to self-defence by darrell's look and tone i may add that i have had this thing in mind for some time have felt that it was coming in fact this new partnership arrangement was made with a view to facilitate matters and he was enough of a gentleman to come forward at once with his proposition darrell gazed out of the window again with unseeing eyes mr underwood he said in a low tone i would never have believed it possible that your infatuation for that man would have led to this there is no infatuation about it the elder man replied hotly it is a matter of good sound judgment and business calculation i know of no man among our townspeople or even in the state to whom i would give my daughter as soon as i would to walcott there are others who may have larger means now but they haven't got his business ability with what i can give push what he has now and what he will make within the next few years she will have a home and position equal to the best is that all you think of mr underwood not all by any means but it is a mighty important consideration just the same but the man is all right morally you with all your prejudice against him can't lay your finger on one flaw in his character mr underwood said darrell slowly i have studied that man i have heard him talk he has no conception of life beyond the sensual the animal he is a brute a beast in thought and act he is no more fit to marry your daughter or even to associate with her than young man interrupted mr underwood laughing good-humouredly i have only one thing against you you are not exactly practical you are like my friend britain inclined to rather high ideals we don't generally find men built according to those ideals and we have to take em as we find em but you will of course allow your daughter to act according to her own judgment 
you surely would not force her into any marriage distasteful to her darrell asked remembering kate's aversion for walcott a young girl's judgment in those matters is not often to be relied upon kate knows that i consider only her best interests and i think her judgment could be brought to coincide with my own at any rate she knows her father's will is law as darrell convinced that argument would be useless made no reply mr underwood added after a pause i know i can trust to your honor that you will not influence her against walcott i shall not of course attempt to influence her one way or the other i have no right but if i had the right if she were my sister that man should never so much as touch the hem of her garment my boy said mr underwood rather brusquely extending one hand and laying the other on darrell's shoulder i understand and you're all right we all consider you one of ourselves and he added somewhat awkwardly you understand if conditions were not just as they are but conditions are just as they are darrell interposed quickly so there is no use discussing what might be were they different the bitterness in his tone struck a chord of sympathy within the heart of the man beside him but he knew not how to express it and it is doubtful whether he would have voiced it had he known how the two clasped hands silently then without a word the elder man left the room not until now had darrell realized how strong had been the hope within his breast that some crisis in his condition might yet reveal enough to make possible the fulfilment of his love the pleasant relations between himself and kate in many respects still remained practically unchanged true his sense of honor forbade any return to the tender familiarities of the past but there yet existed between them a tacit unspoken comradeship beneath which flowed deeply and silently the undercurrent of love not to be easily diverted or turned aside but this he now felt would soon be changed while all hope for the future must be abandoned with a heavy heart darrell awaited developments he soon noted a marked increase in the frequency of walcott's calls at the pines and not caring to embarrass kate by his presence he absented himself from the house as often as possible on those occasions walcott himself must have been very soon aware that in his courtship mr underwood was his sole partisan but he bore himself with a confidence and assurance which would brook no thought of defeat mrs dean knowing her brother as she did was quick to understand the situation and silently showed her disapproval but walcott politely ignored her disfavor as not worth his consideration at first kate considering him her father's guest received him with the same frank winning courtesy which he extended to others and he quick to make the most of every opportunity exerted himself to the utmost in his efforts to entertain his young hostess and her friends to a certain extent he succeeded in that kate was compelled to admit to herself that he could be far more agreeable than she had ever supposed he had travelled extensively and was possessed of good descriptive powers his voice was low and musical and his eyes limpid and tender whenever he fixed them upon her face held her glance by some irresistible magnetic force and invariably brought the deepening color to her cheeks with the first inkling however of the nature of his visits all her old abhorrence of him returned with increased intensity but her ill-concealed aversion only furnished him with a new incentive and spurred him to redouble his attentions the only opposition encountered by him that appeared in the least to disturb his equanimity was that of duke which was on all occasions most forcibly expressed the latter never failing to greet him with a low growl meeting all overtures of friendship with an ominous gleam in his intelligent eyes 
and a display of ivory that made Mr. Walcott only too willing to desist. "'Really, Miss Underwood,' Walcott remarked one evening, when Duke had been more than usually demonstrative, "'your pet's attention to me are sometimes a trifle distracting. Could you not occasionally bestow the pleasure of his society upon someone else, Mr. Darrell, for instance? I imagine the two might prove quite congenial to each other.' "'Please remember, Mr. Walcott, you are speaking of a friend of mine,' Kate replied coldly. "'Mr. Darrell, I beg pardon. I meant no offence. But since he and Duke seems to share the same unaccountable antipathy towards myself, I naturally thought there would be a bond of sympathy between them.' Kate had been playing and was still seated at the piano, idly waiting for Walcott, who was turning the pages of a new music-book to make another selection. She now rose rather wearily, and leaving the piano, joined her father and aunt upon the veranda outside. Walcott pushed the music from him, and taking Kate's mandolin from off the piano, followed. Throwing himself down upon the steps at Kate's feet, in an attitude of genuine Spanish abandon and grace, he said lightly, "'Since you will not favor us further, I will see what I can do.' He possessed little technical knowledge of music, but had quite a repertoire of songs picked up in his travels in various countries, to which he could accompany himself upon the guitar or mandolin. He strummed the strings carelessly for a moment, then in a low voice began a Spanish love song. There was no need of an interpreter to make known to Kate the meaning of the song. The low, sweet cadences were full of tender pleading. Every note was tremulous with passion, while the dark eyes holding her own seemed burning into her very soul. But the spell of the music worked far differently from Walcott's hopes or anticipations. Even while angry at herself for listening, Kate could scarcely restrain the tears, for the tender love strains brought back so vividly the memory of those hours so brief and fleeting in which she had known the pure unalloyed joy of love that her heart seemed near bursting as the last lingering notes died away the pain was more than she could endure and pleading a slight headache she excused herself and went to her room throwing herself upon the bed she gave way to her feelings sobbing bitterly as she recalled the sudden hopeless ending of the most perfect happiness her young life had ever known. Gradually the violence of her grief subsided, and she grew more calm, but a dull pain was at her heart, for though unwilling to admit it even to herself, she was hurt at Darrell's absence on the occasions of Walcott's visits. "'Why does he leave me when he knows I can't endure the sight of that man?' she soliloquized sorrowfully. If he would stay by me, the creature would not dare make love to me. Oh, if we could only just be lovers until all this dreadful uncertainty is past! I am sure it would come out all right, and I would gladly wait years for him, if only he would let me. As she sat alone in her misery, she heard Walcott take his departure. A little later Darrell returned and went to his room, and soon after she heard her aunt step in the hall, followed by a quiet knock at her door. "'Come in, auntie,' she called, wondering what her errand might be. "'Have you gone to bed, Catherine, or are you up?' Mrs. Dean inquired, for the room was dark. "'I am up. Why, auntie?' "'Your father said to tell you he wanted to see you if you had not retired.' Mrs. Dean stopped a moment to inquire for Kate's headache, and as she left the room Kate heard her sigh heavily. A happy thought occurred to Kate as she ran downstairs. She would have her father put a stop to Walcott's intentions. If he knew how they annoyed her, he would certainly do it. She entered the room where he waited, with her sunniest smile, for the stern, gruff-voiced man was the idol of her heart, 
and she believed implicitly in his love for her even though it seldom found expression in words but her smile faded before the displeasure in her father's face he scrutinized her keenly from under his heavy brows but if he noted the traces of tears upon her face he made no comment i did not suppose kate he said slowly for he could not bring himself to speak harshly to her i did not suppose that a child of mine would treat any guest of this house as rudely as you treated mr walcott to-night i sent for you for an explanation i did not mean to be rude papa kate replied seating herself on her father's knee and laying one arm caressingly about his neck but he did annoy me so to-night he has annoyed me so often of late i just couldn't endure it any longer has mr walcott ever conducted himself other than as a gentleman why no papa he is gentlemanly enough so far as that is concerned i thought so her father interposed i should say that he had laid himself out to entertain you and your friends and to make it pleasant for all of us whenever he has been here it strikes me that his manners are very far from annoying that he is a gentleman in every sense of the word he certainly carried himself like one to-night in the face of the treatment you gave him well i am sorry if i was rude i have no objection to him as a gentleman or as an acquaintance if he would not go beyond that but i detest his attentions and his love-making and he will not stop even when he sees that it annoys me no one has a better right to pay his attentions to you for he has asked and received my permission to do so kate drew herself upright and gazed at her father with eyes full of horror you gave him permission to pay attention to me she exclaimed slowly as though scarcely comprehending his meaning then springing to her feet and drawing herself to her full height she demanded do you mean papa that you intend me to marry him for an instant mr underwood felt ill at ease kate's face was white and her eyes had the look of a creature brought to bay that sees no escape from the death confronting it for even in that brief time kate knowing her father's indomitable will realized with a sense of despair the hopelessness of her situation i suppose your marriage will be the outcome at least i hope so her father replied quickly recovering his composure for i certainly know of no one to whom i would so willingly entrust your future happiness listen to me kate have i not always planned and worked for your best interests you always have papa have i not always chosen what was for your good and for your happiness kate gave a silent assent very well then i think you can trust to my judgment in this case but papa she protested this is different i never can love that man i abhor him loathe him do you think there can be any happiness or good in a marriage without love would you and mamma have been happy together if you had not loved each other no sooner had she spoken the words than she regretted them as she noted the look of pain that crossed her father's face in his silent undemonstrative way he had idolized his wife and it was seldom that he would allow any allusion to her in his presence i don't know why you should call up the past he said after a pause but since you have i will tell you that your mother when a girl like yourself objected to our marriage she thought that we were unsuited to each other and that we could never live happily together she listened however to the advice of those older and wiser than she and you know the result the strong man's voice trembled slightly i think our married life was a happy one it was for me i know i hope it was for her 
A long silence followed. To Kate there came the memory of the frail young mother lying day after day upon her couch, in the solitude of her sick-room, often weeping silently, while she, a mere child, knelt sadly and wistfully beside her, as silently wiping the tear-drops as they fell, and wondering at their cause. She understood now, but not for worlds would she have spoken one word to pain her father's heart. At last Mr. Underwood said, rising as though to end the interview, I think I can depend upon you now, Kate, to carry out my wishes in this matter. Kate rose proudly. I have never disobeyed you, papa. I will treat Mr. Walcott courteously, but even though you force me to marry him, I will never, never love him, and I shall tell him so. Her father smiled. Mr. Walcott, I think, has too much good sense to attach much weight to any girlish whims. That will pass. You will think differently by and by. As she stopped for her usual good-night kiss, she threw her arms about her father's neck, and, looking appealingly into his face, said, Papa, it need not be very soon, need it? You are not in a hurry to be rid of your little girl? Don't talk foolishly, child, he answered hastily. You know I've no wish to be rid of you, but I do want to see you settled in a home of your own, equal to the best. And, as I said a while ago, and told Mr. Darrell in talking the matter over with him, I know of no one in whose hands I would so willingly place you and your happiness as Mr. Walcott's. As for the date and other matters of that sort, he added playfully pinching her cheeks, I suppose those will all be mutually arranged between the gentleman and yourself. Kate had started back slightly. "'You have talked this over with Mr. Darrell?' she exclaimed. "'Yes, why not? What did he think of it?' "'Well,' said her father slowly, "'naturally he did not quite fall in with my views, for I think he is not just what you could call a disinterested party. I more than half suspect that Mr. Darrell would like to step into Mr. Walcott's place himself, if he were only eligible.' But knowing that he is not, he is too much of a gentleman to commit himself in any way. Mr. Underwood scanned his daughter's face keenly as he spoke, but it was as impassive as his own. To Kate, Darrell's absences of late were now explained. He understood it all. She kissed her father silently. You know, Puss, I am looking out for your best interest in all of this, said her father a little troubled by her silence. "'I know that is your intention, papa,' she replied with gentle gravity, and left the room. End of chapter 17 Read by Lars Rolander